Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Bruce Temple. I'm together with Jamie Saragossi, co-chair of the Antonio Prelick Memorial Lecture Committee. And uh, we're very pleased that our speaker, Joyce Bacchus, will be presenting you this afternoon. Uh, Jamie will have more to say about that. Um, Antonia Prelick was the founding director of the Health Sciences Library at Stony Brook. And there's a lot of history in that, that I, as a newcomer, having arrived only in 2009, really know only secondhand. But we do have someone here who knows a lot about it firsthand. Uh, Arthur Groban, who was the founding chair of the Department of Pharmacological Sciences at Stony Brook, and uh, a very good friend of Tony Prelick and was also, I think, instrumental in helping establish the lecture. So Arthur will fill you in on that. Please, Arthur. Well, welcome. I'll add my welcome to Bruce's, and it's always a pleasure to uh, talk about someone who had really been so um, instrumental here in the Health Sciences Center. So Toni Prelick was born in Croatia in 1929, and she took her degree in physics and mathematics. I assume that's where she met her husband, Christo, who was a physicist, and they decided that they wouldn't have identical careers. So she then, th and we're thankful for that, she pursued her um, career in librarianship. She came with Christo to Princeton in 1967, where she was a librarian. And then Stony Brook was, of course, getting its start, the health sciences part, just in the early 1970s. And she was uh, lured here when we only had the Melville Library. Now, Ed Pellegrino, the founding president of um, the Health Sciences Center, or vice president, was a really, not only visionary, but uh, he was a true scholar. So the first thing he did when he was appointed president was to start to collect books. Not just books, but entire libraries. So when Tony got here as a founder, where she, most places, she would have had to try to find the books to, for the past. And in those days, you, the older members here remember books were very central to research and to uh, uh, your clinical activities, but she had a huge number because Pellegrino had bought up whole libraries and stored the books in vacant grocery stores. So she had all the back issues and all she had to do, well, not all, but uh, was to look forward and uh, of course she was very good at that. Now what most of us who overlapped with her remember was a personal relationship. She did, develop with faculty. She didn't send a memorandum around and say, what books do you want me to get? She'd appear at your office door with books under her hand. Now, they weren't randomly suggested. She clearly knew each of these fields well enough to pick four or five of the key books and say, please, Dr. Groman or whoever it was, to take them home and look them over and decide what we ought to keep. Well, nothing could be. First, it was good, and second, it was very effective. She was also socially a very gracious hostess and a gourmet cook, both her and her uh, husband, and Christo, and a number of us, I see some in the audience, uh, uh, were able to participate in that. Now, but what made the library and what uh, was her ability to champion new technologies? Again, remember, she came in the book area, but way before anybody was thinking about uh, digital, she was, and I recall specifically as uh, chair then of the library committee, when she urged me to go to California to UCSF, which was doing the first experiment in such things, and I brought back the news, you know, that this really was an effective way and looked like the future, and then she made it the future at Stony Brook. Now, unfortunately, she died quite prematurely in 1999, and, uh, but I'm pleased and, um, that her family, starting really with her husband, Christo, established a memorial fund which supports this lecture. So it wasn't just her family, it was her family and friends and colleagues, and it's 
hard for some of us to collect money on things like that. Nothing was easier than to collect money uh, funds to uh, contribute to the memorial fund. Now the endowment provides support not only for the annual lecture, but also for visiting uh, librarians to be brought here and bring new ideas in, again, in keeping with the way uh, 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 Tony thought. You have to have new ideas, you have to have new technologies, and uh, she showed us the way. We've had a series of very distinguished lectures, and we have one today, and uh, Jamie Will Sagarosa will introduce Dr. Backus. Thank you, Arthur. Today I have the privilege of introducing our 2016 Prelic Visiting Scholar, Joyce Backus, Associate Director of the Library, uh, excuse me, Associate Director for Library Operations of the National Library of Medicine and the National Institutes of Health. The family. And here we have our lecturer today, Joyce Backus. Uh, like Tony, Joyce has dedicated her career to furthering <laughs> medical librarianship and providing information not only to clinicians but also to consumers. I've had the pleasure of hearing Joyce deliver updates of, on the National Library of Medicine at the Medical Library Association Annual Conference. And today I am pleased to welcome Joyce to Stony Brook University. Joyce received her AB in Sociology and English from Duke University and her master's in library science from Catholic University of America. Joyce began her career at the National Library of Medicine after completing her postgraduate training as an NLM associate. In her various roles since, she has worked on many projects furthering access to quality health information, namely leading the development and release of Medline Plus Connect, a system that uses clinical health IT standards to bring health information to patients. Joyce is well published in the area of consumer health access to information and using the web to disseminate health information. She presents extensively on consumer health and health literacy resources and strategies. Her awards and honors are many, including the Innovates Award from the Department of Health and Human Services for her work on Medline Plus Connect and the NLM's Frank B. Rogers Award in recognition for more than 10 years of technical oversight and programmatic direction of Medline Plus and for moving NLM's consumer health products into the national spotlight. We are honored to have Joyce here to deliver the Antonia Prelick Memorial Lecture today titled The Role of the National Library of Medicine in Perver Preserving the Country's Cultural Heritage. So please join me today in giving Joyce Backus a warm welcome. You're going to think I'm moving in here. I brought my own book. <laughs> well, it sounds like the honoree was an early proponent of um, demand-based collecting, which we do now, where the patron can look at the uh, availability of materials and say which ones they want. And it sounds like uh, Antonia Prelick was early in that, bringing the materials <laughs> right to the user and saying, which ones of these do you want? So that was, that was quite a quite an early innovation. Um, it's an honor to be here today in so many ways. First of all, let me assure all of you here that you have wonderful hosts in Bruce and Jamie and Arthur, and I look forward to um, meeting the family further. It's already been a lovely day here, which I know you may or may not take credit for, but it's great to see your campus. And it's really an honor to bring greetings from the National Library of Medicine, which is part of the National Institutes of Health, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that. I think uh, Mrs. Prelick would appreciate the focus today on collections, because collections are really the heart of what the library is. And although they have changed over the years and will continue changing, uh, without a collection, whether it's electronic or physical, you know, the library is, um, is just a place without, um, without substance. So um, I will be um, talking about that. I also heard um, in the introduction that Antonia was one who listened to the users. 
And my message here today about the National Library of Medicine, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the programs that touch your world, whether you're educators or researchers or librarians, is an organization that likes to listen to people. And um, in preparing for this talk and in my work, I've noticed that this has pervaded our history from the very beginning. So I'll be sharing some elements of that. The expanded title of my talk could be NLM's historic role in identifying, collecting, preserving, training professionals, and providing permanent access to the country's scientific cultural heritage. But it doesn't look as good on a poster, so we'll stick to, to the one we've got. So way back in the beginning, this delightfully cheerful fellow, Thomas Lawson, had a room of books. And the room of books was there to serve the physicians that were part of the US Army at the time. And the fact that he asked for money from Congress to help pay for the books is when we mark the beginning of the founding of the National Library of Medicine as, um, as, as part of the, uh, the Surgeon General's um, collection. But our first director was really John Shaw Billings. Now, you may recognize John Shaw Billings because when he left the National Library of Medicine, he became the librarian of the New York Public Library. So he also had a, had a big effect on, a, on this area of geography. His qualification to be the librarian was that he had been very good at keeping the statistics and preserving the medical specimens that were sent to the new Army Medical Museum. So his superiors in the Army said, hmm, we think this guy may be good at running a library. And it turns out he was. Now I'm gonna take a little, um, a little trip to the present um, through the past and show you the directors we have had uh, this is an excerpt from a publication that was obviously published um, slightly after 1949, but you can see um, the history of all the people who were the directors of the Army Medical Library, and then we became the National Library of Medicine. I'll tell you a little bit more about that um, in about 1958 with the law in our building in 1961. But I think what you, what you will notice, and we just saw the uh, gorilla um, ex exhibition on campus, you'll notice that these were all men until um, Donald A.B. Lindbergh, who gave this lecture um, about a decade ago, retired as our director after 30 years, and we had our acting director, Betsy Humphreys, who served in that role and for 18 months until our newly appointed director, Patricia Flatley Brennan, came to join us just a short eight weeks ago. And I will take a quick um, diversion and tell you about Patty Brennan, because she has quite a different um, background from all of our other directors. First of all, she's the first that is, is not a medical doctor. She's a nurse, and she has a PhD in industrial engineering, which brings a really different point of view to the library, and we're very excited to be working with her. I'll say a little bit more about Patty in a minute, but um, I think it's interesting to see this word cloud of the titles of the papers she's written that are in PubMed. And I think looking at this cloud, you can see lots of words that are important to us today and have become more important um, in providing healthcare and supporting research in libraries, like words like informatics, information, care, patients, and health. Much of her research has been around patient-centric um, services and patient-centric information. So it's gonna be really fun to see over the next several years uh, the kind of focus that our new director brings to the library. But back to the past. So one of the first things that Dr. Billings did was to create this um, sample document, a specimen fasci you know, they told me how to say fasci fasci fasciculus, thank you, of um, the collection. Because if you've got a room full of books and no one knows you have the room full of books, what good does it do? So he created this sample and said, hey folks, what do you think of this? Should I do more of this? Well, it turns out that people really liked this list because they could take it with them, they could make a request to the library, or they could go back to the library and see what they had. So this was really kind of an early catalog. And what's really interesting about it is right in the preface, back when it was the, Ar the library of the Surgeon General of the Army, he saw this as potentially the National Medical Library. So he really, while he was dealing with a room of books, and his modest list of these books that could help people, he really saw the future that this should be a resource for the nation. Jumping ahead about 80 years or so, 
Um, apparently, we were um, moving along and collecting books and doing what libraries do, but apparently some people thought we weren't doing a really good job. So what do you do when you think maybe you need some help? You call in the consultants. So there was a study paid for by the, Ro the Rockefeller Foundation, and you can see some, some New York names on this list. And um, they did a study of the library. They did a management study and delivered it and said, here are some of the problems with your organization. Here are some of the things you're doing wrong. And some of it was about collections. I'm only going to talk about the collections part. But this dapper fellow, um, Joseph McNinch, was our director for just three short years. But he was the director right after this report was written. Oh, I have one more photo of him. I like this one because he kind of um, channels um, who? Uh, the singer, whose name I can't remember right now. Elvis, thank you. I think he's kind of channeling Elvis in this photo. But anyway, I had this book when I was doing um, research around how our collections came along, and he had inscribed in the front of this book, this was my Bible. It turns out this inscription was not in the catalog record, although they probably added it after I found it. But I thought that was really cool. So anyway, in this report, they said, here's what we should acquire in the library. And um, these, are, these are all still things that, that many libraries do, but being a, a national library, aspiring to be a national library, said we should collect all publications in all languages related to the science of medicine. The thing I really noticed in this, though, is this little phrase in the middle. The quack and crank publications should not be omitted. So while we should be collecting in what we believe in the future and for now, is um, authoritative scientific information. Sometimes the authority of that information, as those of us in the room well know, is in the eyes of the beholder or perhaps the eyes of the author. Um, so they were recommending that for the sake of, of uh, social science, for the sake of history, and knowing what happened in science, uh, the quack and the crank should not be omitted. And I'd like to say um, I can guarantee we have the quack and the crank, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So um, out of that report came our, our sc scope and coverage manual in 1951. We have maintained this going forward. Here's a, a set of uh, a distinguished gentlemen who came together to do this. They held, of course, what do you do? You hold a scientific meeting. They held a meeting at the library and um, told us what we should be doing, had this uh, talk. This is a building, for those of you that know Washington, DC, we used to be at this building uh, before we were on the NIH campus, it was on the site of the Hirschhorn Museum, the Sculpture Museum on the National Mall in DC. So that used to be the location of our library. And we actually have evidence that our sister library, the Library of Congress, used to send medical books in a, a, car, a horse cart down the road to us because it was agreed upon even back then, and I'll talk about this in a minute, that we should be the collector of the professional medical books. And uh, so they came to us in a horse cart down the road. So here's a, a note about the, the seminar we had. So we've asked for feedback. Um, we had a, the Rockefeller uh, funded people told us what we should be doing. We had another symposium come in and tell us what we should um, collect. And then finally, we became the National Library of Medicine with this public law. And in this public law, very specifically, uh, we have the charge to acquire and preserve these books. Uh, pertinent to medicine. And one of the really great things about this law, as old as it is, it's uh, slightly older than I am, is that it still holds today. And those of you who are involved, well, we're all involved in, in medicine and, and health information in some way or another, but they have great definitions here that still hold today. They didn't think just about uh, the, the, the care provided by medical doctors or um, they weren't too specific. They thought very broadly, and today we actually um, still use these broad areas. They even went so far as to, um, at the bottom here, uh, talk about these sciences related to health and medicine. And I'm sure um, that the Health Sciences Library here thinks broadly about medicine, as does the National Library of Medicine. We have this very exciting publication that is actually the successor to all of those that we saw um, previously that you can go to today and it tells you exactly um, what we collect in all of these areas and I know many libraries use this as the basis for their collections as well. As I said, we work with the other uh, three major national libraries, the Library of Congress, the National Agricultural Library, and this is a picture of our own library at our 175th anniversary six years ago. There are certain areas of overlap, uh, in particular veterinary sciences, um, nutrition, and um, biotechnology, and we have joint statements with them to be sure that we're using your tax dollars, frankly, as efficiently as possible. 
Okay, so strategic planning. Um, collections, because they're the core to what the National Library of Medicine do, have been a part of the strategic plans of the library over the years, and because we have new leadership and a new director coming in, um, they still continue to do so. So let me walk you through a few of the strategic, strategic plans. So here's the strategic plan that was created in 1986 when Dr. Donna Lindbergh first came to the library, and you can see very highlighted, uh, highlighted in the top that it was to um, guarantee preservation of a resource for these libraries and to preserve permanently the content of books, periodicals, and other library materials. And of course today, when library materials can look like a variety of items from hard disks to software to all kinds of things, it's nice that the law and this always included uh, happy phrases like and other materials. Uh, skipping ahead a couple of reports, the 2000 to 2005 was the first one that really talked about preserving electronic information. We certainly had a lot of electronic information before that point, but it, it wasn't a focus. So at that point, they added electronic information to the planning. Then the strategic plan that we're just um, getting getting out of, it sounds like we're whittling out of an outfit or something, but that we're, we're just finishing up with is this 2006 to 16. And again, it talks about the collections, biomedical data. I think this is the first time that we mentioned data, medical knowledge, and also um, making them in uh, usable forms. Now, usable forms is kind of in the eye of the beholder, too. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we try to make that information available in usable forms in uh, many ways, and usable not just to humans nowadays, but to machines, because it's just as important that machines can use this information <laughs> as we humans can. Okay, so we have an institution that's had a lot of directors. Um, Donna Lindbergh took us leaps and bounds um, into this century, but retired after 30 years. And the director of the National Institutes of Health, Francis Collins, uh, gave pause and said, uh, let me ask some experts. So again, NIH and NLM reaching out to expert uh, communities such as yourselves. Um, what should NLM be in the future? So he pulled a committee together. It was co-chaired by Harlem Krumholtz of Yale and Eric Green, who's the director of the National Institute of, of the Human Genome. And they put together this report and delivered it in June of 2014. And the report was supposed to be the instructions on what we should hire for our next director. So the key things around collections were this, that we must continuously evolve. And as you can see from back in the beginning, and I'll show you some of our current products, we have evolved. Um, to bring health information to people like those of you in this room who are providing information, who are doing research and providing health care. It also called out in particular history, which is really interesting because everything we collect today becomes tomorrow's history. It's something that you may be able to use in your classroom, in your curriculum, in your patient care today, but of course we want to be sure it's there for long-term use. So they called these things out as the future of the library and uh, we hired a director. So now that Patty Brennan is with us, what are we doing? We're having a strategic plan, which is good. So the strategic plan uh, is um, a part of our Board of Regents. We have a Board of Regents that's charged with reporting to direct, directly to the um, Secretary of Health and Human Services. And um, this is the subcommittee of the Board of Regents that's doing the planning. And there's going to be delivering to us a plan by the end of next year with a 10-year horizon for vision and a five-year horizon for plan. Uh, my staff keeps asking me what that means. I said, I don't know. We'll see it when we see the plan, and we'll know what it means. But, but what I think it, and I, I tell them this, what I think it means is that um, for five years, we may have actual steps and actual charges, but the vision for where the library will be, the, the committee, the, the plan will feel free to have a 10-year vision. So we'll see how that works. Um, those of you familiar with the library and even with NIH, uh, may be getting requests for information or RFI fatigue. Uh, we've, we've noted to ourselves and our, our co-leaders that we're asking people a lot these days. NIH has been asking our, uh, questions around the BG2K initiative. We've been asking questions about the National Library of Medicine. There was a request for information out when we did the, um, the planning for the new director. And I am supposed to assure everyone who has submitted feedback for any of those that we will be considering that feedback. But if you haven't yet written us and you have thoughts about what we should do that may differ from feedback you sent us to any of those other things, we will have another request for information out in November, and I'm sure you'll be seeing it on your professional uh, listservs. So we welcome your feedback. I'm not going to assume that you know where the National Library of Medicine is. So we're in the state of Maryland, and we're on the campus of the NIH here. 
interesting to note that we do not serve the five or 6,000 scientists that are at the NIH. There's actually a very good NIH library run by Keith Cogdill, and they are the library for the campus. Um, they are up here, I think I have a pointer. They're up here where the clinical center is, and we're down here where this little red thing is. So we have a, a campus, it's about 16,000 people. Um, the important thing for you to know as researchers and taxpayers, and probably you do, is that of the $30 billion that is the NIH budget, less than 20% is spent here on this campus on research. Most of it goes out to universities such as yourself, and that's, that's a really important part of the mission. Um, this is our building when it was newly minted in 1961. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how we store the collections. So in this building, the, the tall white part you see there is one floor. The little strip on top of it with the little windows are offices. That's actually where my office is, and I have these little windows that are look up at the sky there and then provide daylight. The collections are stored in three floors below ground. Um, this was a Cold War designed building and the idea was that should something terrible happen in Washington DC, the collections would survive and mankind, you would have the medical information you needed to survive even though maybe you didn't, I don't know. But anyway, it's a Cold War <laughs> designed building and the collections are on three floors below ground. When the library opened in 1961, it looked like this. And not too long ago, when I took a cell phone picture, it looks like this. So the, the interior really has not changed too much, although the, the platform apparently only lasted a day or two while they opened the building. Uh, you can see Frank Rogers, one of our early directors, was the fellow delivering the speech, and you can see him here in the shelves. We still have a lot of shelves that look like this on the left, but what we have done is we have filled in with compact shelving. And as publishing, as you know, publishing has grown immensely um, we have installed this. Now, really cool thing, this is kind of an engineering geekish thing, but um, the third floor of the building, of course, is on bedrock and very strong, so you can put extra weight, you can put these shelves on there. The other floors, the engineers said not so much, but we had a really smart engineer who got in some uh, industrial people who had done this sort of thing to structures like parking garages. Now, I don't know how comfortable I feel that we've designed our library to be like a parking garage, but this is a Kevlar fabric material that gets epoxied down in kind of a grid pattern that you see there. It doesn't get covered on the whole floor, and when they do this on the floor and the ceiling, we're allowed to put compact shelves. So there you go. It was a pretty cost-effective way to do it, so now we have compact shelved the whole thing, and we think our building is good to 2013 unless we get less print, which we're kind of count. Uh, 2030, 2030, thank you, Bruce, <laughs> that we, uh, we think we're going with. Not all of our materials are there in the library. We have some out here in Boyers, Pennsylvania in a place called Iron Mountain. Uh, we understand, although they don't really share, that some of the tenants of Iron Mountain include um, people like the Microsoft Foundation, the Sony Corporation, and other Hollywood places. So this little red door is our door to, our, to where we keep some things, and this is a vault where we keep some um, early microfilms and films that need to be kept in... Um, it's cold storage, so we send staff out there occasionally and they come back with pictures of them bundled up uh, to do inventory and check on things and occasionally move things back and forth. But um, some of our collections were here. So um, part of collecting and being part of the nation's cultural heritage is to be able to um, keep collections in places like this. So most of them are in our building, but we have some things out there. All right, so now we're coming to you and how our collection interacts with you even though you don't come to Bethesda, Maryland to, to use the collection. And I have to tell you, I've been at the library over 30 years and we used to have people come to the library and use the collection. Not so much anymore and that is just fine. So uh, NLM has never been great at naming things if you, if you want my uh, opinion. So these are the names I have to deal with. So the National Library of Medicine Journal Collection is big. It's, it's about 17,000, and those of you who are librarians know that we call things serials if you order them once and they keep coming. <laughs> and that's a journal. We all know about peer-reviewed journals, but there are a lot of other things like that. There's these annuals that you can order once and they come. There are statistical compendium. There are other kinds of publications that come, and I'm not talking about good housekeeping, although I guess that could be one of them, um, that just keep coming. So we have about 17,000 of those, and we make those available through a catalog, and you can look them up, but to me, and we provide interlibrary loan, and we ensure that they're archived, so that's good. 
But where our collections really meet you in the services is when you get to PubMed Medline and PubMed Central. So I will try to make this clear and uh, you can ask me more questions later because it may be clear as mud. Let me first start with the collection. Collecting used to be easy. At least that's what my colleagues tell me. Because we would get paper catalogs and they would come from publishers who had a huge or at least a modest business behind that publication. They had a printing press, they had an editorial staff, maybe they were a university press. And if we got a catalog from a publisher who we had dealt with before and they said, we're publishing a new journal called Trends in Immunology, we would check that box as the National Library of Medicine based on all that information from collecting and order it sight unseen. Well, as you very well know, and um, how many offers did you get to be an editor on a fake journal, I mean a, a journal today, um, the world has changed. So we didn't have something called publisher review. We have in just, uh, to be honest, in maybe the last three years implemented a publisher review. And we have a team that is working really hard to determine the authenticity of the publisher. And it goes right along with that famous, you know, dog on the internet cartoon. Sometimes when they Google the addresses of somebody claiming to be a publisher, we have one famous picture. It's a weedy lot <laughs> somewhere in California. Um, but it could be a weedy lot on Long Island. I mean, it's, it's really tricky. So we are really being challenged and to keep up with what is a publisher and what isn't. As I know, you are in libraries, and if you're trying to publish and figure out you know, which journal is real and which ones aren't, we're working on that. Um, but it's not easy. And this is actually why I know that we are collecting the quack and the crank, because journals get past us, publishers get past us, and then something doesn't click, or something <laughs> does click, and we think, huh, we better look at this one. It looks like we had one that was submitting to PMC, which I'll talk about, and they were submitting fall issues to us and they were submitting, uh, the, the articles had submission dates that were in the future. So they would say, they would send it to us in August and say, this was submitted by the author on October 18th and we accepted it on October 25th. And we actually had a difficult discussion with this publisher, and I forget which country they were in, to explain why they couldn't do that. And they're like, but it's for that issue. We said, no, you can't say you got this in the future. <laughs> anyway, so, our collecting has changed, and the feedback we get from people is that, that this is important. So then there's journal review, and we actually do journal review on three levels now. We review it for that great big bubble of the collection, which is kind of a loose, trying to keep out the quack and the crank, and apparently, according to our predecessors, it's okay if it gets in. We have a very stringent uh, committee that reviews for Medline that I'll tell you about, and then we have the PubMed Central review. So let me tell you some... Um, steps on that. So as far as the publisher review, we're trying to figure out, are they a true entity? Uh, do they have um, business experience? What is their peer review? And they have to submit a lot of information to us, and then we decide if they're acceptable or unacceptable. I'm afraid we don't publish the list of unacceptable publishers, and one of the reasons is we have publishers moving in and off of that list all the time, because um, if you have a publisher that's unacceptable, sometimes it's to their advantage to decide to get bought by a publisher that we might have as acceptable. So anyway, this is a moving target, but we are, we are working at it. So PubMed Central is our full text archive of journal articles. And those of you that are aware of the public access uh, requirement for federally funded research uh, might know that we also are taking the federally funded articles for the Department of Health and Human Services, for NASA, for the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, for the CDC and some other federal. So out of these four million full text articles, a lot of them come from um, federally funded public access. And those are full text. Um, the bibliographic records, the you know, author title abstract for those all go into PubMed. And then part of PubMed is the ones we select for Medline. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So here's the front page of PubMed Central. You can see they keep a running tab, so any of you can look at any time and see who we have in there. Um, when PubMed Central started about 12 years ago, uh, we were able to take almost anybody who applied. And then we started to realize that there was some journals that were getting in and using it as a way to legitimize 
their publishing practice where maybe their publishing didn't really deserve to be legitimized. So in 2014, we started an expert panel, again, asking the experts on the outside to tell us, you know, which one of these journals they thought were worthy of the federal government archiving in PubMed Central and which one's not. So we started this review process. Here's what the review process looked like. Basically, the first step is to figure out, is this actually a journal? Um, have they published articles? Are they in a final form? Are they full of typographical errors? Um, are, they, are they written in, in reasonably clear scientific English? And then they are allowed to submit a publication. And then we try to look at the scientific quality. And that's where the expert reviewers come in. They make recommendations to us. And then only if it passes that quality review do we do the technical evaluation to decide, um, because even though they may have the quality, they also have to be able to submit to us um, XML files and to be able to participate in it. So There's another way that literature gets into PubMed Central, and that is through um, scanning of older materials. And we've been very fortunate to have gifts from the Wellcome Foundation and the JISC in the UK to do this. Uh, we had a, a project that uh, put in 1.2 of the million of those articles from PubMed Central, and we actually got a second gift from them a couple of years ago, and we're in the process of scanning um, articles uh, from back then. The, the welcome gives us the gift money, and we provide a lot of in-kind support as far as the software to get the, the articles in. Um, we supply a lot of staffing to do it, so it's been a, it's been a really great partnership. Here's some examples of some of the materials that have, have gone into the PubMed Central. And what we have learned is if you make this material available on the internet, people look at it. We don't have a lot of evidence about what they do, but we know that they look at every single article. So even though we're putting in these articles from a very long time ago, and they're probably not being used for current scientific um, research, they certainly are used by you know, anyone on the planet who, who would find them interesting or useful from students to professors to um, anybody. Okay, so Medline. Medline has been around, oh wait, I have a graphic on this. Medline has been around for 45 years. <laughs> and you can see it started a very long time ago and it says that little gray person is representing 22 users in 1971. Um, the director that preceded Don Lindbergh was also very forward thinking and we, we had computers that were putting together the printed books that kept up with the medical literature called Index Medicus and he, uh, Marty Cummings realized that we were going to be able to do more with these computers than just print books. So he made the, um, the computer software available on the internet and it's just grown since then. So it's been uh, 45 years that we've had uh, Medline available on the internet. So Medline currently has 26 million citations, and um, the important thing about this is we have a federal advisory committee that I am the, um, the government representative to, and they meet three times a year and they review journals for Medline. Right now they are only recommending about 15% of what they review go into Medline. And we do some basic screening to make sure back on the is it really a journal and is the publisher acceptable but they have a very high um, scientific standards and are only recommending about 15% of what they review. Um, occasionally what they review is a good journal, but it may be um, maybe not research in the strictest sense. We have, um, well, uh, you can ask me later because probably chances are some of you in the room have been editors or editorial members of, of journals that we have or have not selected for Medline, and I'm happy to answer questions about that. These are the criteria that the committee is using um, to select those journals, and uh, they do a pretty thorough job. And we, I should point out to the organizations at the bottom that we do um, belong to, we belong to all of those. I'm the, the representative to that International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, but we really um, want people to follow these. Okay, so we have all those journals, and we have Medline, and we have PubMed, and everybody can get to that, but in those three floors below ground, we have a lot of stuff that the world could really use, and of course, you know, everybody wants everything on the internet. We're working on it. Uh, it'll take us a few centuries at the pace we're going, but, but we are working on it. And you can see here, um, this is something called uh, digital collections, and uh, you can get to it by looking up digital collections. It has a lot of really cool stuff. And this call out shows you it has almost 70,000 pictures. It has 17,000 uh, books. 
and it has 235 movies, and it has one piece of software. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But I think I'm going to try to run this video for you here. And um, the reason I'm going to run this video is for a couple of reasons. It's a video of Franklin Roosevelt dedicating the National Institute of Health. And um, it's not of really good quality. It looks kind of like a, a GoPro <laughs> video, and it cuts in and out. But we found it when we were doing some inventory work, and there's no evidence that there's another copy of this. So it's the kind of thing that makes me you know, really proud to be part of this organization that can make these materials on the, available on the internet. Some of the other moving images are um, public health films, uh, especially from the World Wars, World War, well, you know what the World Wars are, and um, you know, how to keep the soldiers safe. There are a lot of government films, but um, we do have some really interesting things that uh, you can't find elsewhere. So I'm gonna start it, and I'm gonna try to scroll ahead to minute one and show you about three minutes of Franklin Roosevelt, and you'll see it really is not the best quality, which is, which is interesting, but still important. We have this really cool software that we do the, the um, transcript on the right. And you can search any word in here, and it'll go to the place in the film. But my preservation people, t all right, sorry, preservation people, tell me it's really important to have all of the films. So there's all this like blank stuff up front. All right, now I'm going to guess. All right, these are the crowds gathering. And if I hit this, we think we'll have sound. So you gotta have the band. I don't know who took this video. It's very amateurish. Mr. Coy, Dr. Thompson, and the governor of Maryland, Governor O'Connor. Ladies way. and gentlemen, nowhere in the world except in the Americas is it possible for any nation to devote a great sector of its effort to life conservation rather than life destruction? All of us are grateful that we in the United States can still turn our thoughts and our attention to those institutions of our country that symbolize peace, institutions whose purpose it is to save life and not to destroy it. It is for the dedication of these noble buildings to the service of man that we are assembled here today. The National Institute of Health speaks the universal language of humanitarianism. The total defense that we have heard so much about of late, that total defense which this nation seeks involves a great deal more than building airplanes and ships and guns and bombs. For we cannot be a strong nation unless we are a healthy nation. And so we must recruit not only men and materials, but also knowledge and science in the service of our national strength. So I think his words sort of resonate today um, to me as well. And there are lots of, lots of really interesting videos, but I just wanted to play that little clip. And uh, we don't know that there's any other source of that information. That, um, the, we have the transcript, obviously, but we don't have any other source of that video. So um, pretty inspirational. Oh, so we're putting a lot of cool stuff in here like that. Another way, in addition to um, us digitizing and putting things in digital collections, is we work with other organizations. And we have worked with this group, the Medical Heritage Library, and um, come together and we each agreed upon which books in our collection we would scan and not scan the same books and put them in the shared collective medical heritage library and then they also all go off to the internet archive and that funding came from these places so 
Well, we're, um, you know, we, we're, we're funded at the National Institutes of Health and we do what we can. It's always great if we can leverage what we can do with other organizations and this is a great example of when we were able to do that. So I said I was gonna mention software a little bit. Um, another way we've leveraged what we're able to do is to bring in um, fellows, as I know, I'm sure your organization does too. As a matter of fact, I understand uh, the Memorial Fund funds that. Um, this is Nicole at Contaxis, and she came in with a project that uh, I conceived, which was the National Library of Medicine. As you saw, we've been in the forefront of, of some of these software um, um, programs that brought medical information to people. And we've, we've had researchers do this. And uh, many, much of the software, there's no computer to run it anymore. There's no source code for it anymore. You know, what does this mean for our cultural heritage going forward? So she came in and the first thing she did as our digital stewardship resident was to do a survey and find out what did we have. And, it, and our fears were realized in that she found some printouts of some of the code, but basically we got nothing. We got newsletter articles talking about the software. Um, but what she found um, we did have was a tutorial. We had a, a, an early software program that was PC-based called and Mac-based called Grateful Med. And it was a piece of software. Uh, maybe some of you had the opportunity, I'll call it, to use it. But basically, it let you formulate a search in your PC. It had a complete medical subject headings vocabulary. And you would couple it to your uh, telephone and it would dial up and it would minimize its use of our mainframe which is very expensive and bring the information back well that environment is gone so even though we did actually do actually have some of the three and a half and five and a half inch disks and some computers to run it there's no mainframe there anymore that speaks that language but we did have us a tutorial so in digital collections is a run version of the tutorial which of course in telling you how you would use this program back then um, models and shows you how it worked so it was one way that we could preserve that experience and the knowledge of what that software was for people who have no idea what PCs and modems and all that kind of stuff was. So we're going to be working on doing more of that. But it's just a really interesting example of collecting, because collecting isn't necessarily just books. There's so many pieces of our, of our heritage and medical information that's collecting. Um, we're working on increasing the things we, we collect in here, and this is um, part of it. Oh, the other thing I'll just mention is this born digital content thing. What we're finding is, especially maybe in the world of cereals, is that um, our state health departments, our medical schools, our non-governmental organizations aren't printing anymore. They're creating a PDF and putting it up and making it available, which is terrific because anybody on the planet with an internet connection and a PDF reader can get to it. But what happens next year? What happens after that? So we're working on ways to start collecting that and bringing that in, and that's where I'm going to focus now. So the web. The web is a terrific thing. Everything's out there. But um, I don't know if you bookmark or save things or even just click on somebody else's website. It disappears. So we have a project to archive and collect um, medical information on the web. It's very thematic at this point. It's not comprehensive. But we try to collect in areas that we think will be representative and do something going forward. So we have one in health and medicine blogs. We have one on an avian flu. Um, and I'll show you, we did um, one around Ebola uh, news and some other things. Uh, the other part of collections that's growing is archives. So our, our, our scientific knowledge, a lot of it is contained in the lab notebooks and archives, and that's another area that we're, we're strongly collecting in. Um, we had, uh, this is another thematic project, and the reason I want to talk about this is because it's not only on our website, but it's out in the Internet Archive. So we've uh, curated uh, sort of two sides of the developing and aging brain. We have an archive in autism and another in Alzheimer's. To capture this information on the web from blogs and news media and um, people's thoughts as the, uh, as the event is going on, as, as um, things are unfolding in autism and Alzheimer's. Um, here's the Ebola outbreak, which we started very early on. And just to let you know, we are um, eating our own cooking, and we're also archiving our own website because we realized that we were being remiss and um, weren't doing that. But now we're, we're archiving our own websites as well. I've talked a lot about collections in the traditional sense and publishing and peer-reviewed articles and how all those things work. 
But the National Library of Medicine is very involved in uh, collecting current science and in the service of medicine. And one of the sites that we run in conjunction with the Food and Drug Administration is clinicaltrials.gov. And it's been around already 10 years now. So it is already becoming an historic archive for where clinical trials are. Some of you may be aware of the issue of the non-publication of clinical trials results. It is documenting that non-publication because people are having to record the, um, the establishment of their clinical trial before they start in here. And then sometimes that's all we get. They ran a clinical trial, at least they were funded to do so. Maybe they didn't get enough participants. Maybe they, um, you know, all kinds of things didn't happen, but this is becoming a serious record of science. And I would be very remiss if I didn't talk about publications and collections if I didn't mention the collection of data. And one of the great examples of that is the, the genome, the Human Genome uh, Project is, is archived at the National Library of Medicine, archived in the sense that people are submitting data at a tremendous rate. And um, we have over, I looked uh, in preparation for this talk, we have over 200 mammals the genomes for over 200 mammals. And when you get into bacteria, I think there were um, 17,000 different organisms. So it's a great resource, and I'm sure some of you in this room could probably uh, know more about it than I do. But the important thing about both of these is that the publications are data, and they're available not just to humans clicking on websites, but also to machines. And that is really where we're going, where the machine-to-machine -machine interactions with the National Library of Medicine at this point there are more transactions by machines at the National Library of Medicine than there are by people, because machines are able to react quicker, people are creating all kinds of products that use our resources, and um, that's a really important aspect of our collecting. Um, speaking of machines and dissemination, we have um, lots of projects. These are just two uh, demonstration projects and groups we're working with on getting that data out in a machine-to-machine -machine way, and we have an, an RDF version of our medical subject headings, and if you know what that is, um, you know what that is. Um, we have pages of how you can get the data out there, um, and that, that, so this is a page that represents that. Um, very interestingly, our history of medicine division is actually one of the leading areas in getting this information out there, and we have converted um, our entire catalog of historic data, 3.7 million citations out there uh, for humanitarians and social scientists to use and to look at the, the history of medicine. So I brought along our coffee table book. I don't know if the Health Sciences Library has a coffee table, but um, if you do, um, this is a book that we published uh, a couple of years ago that has some treasures in it. I think it's a really nice representation of where collecting and medicine has been, um, the kind of collecting that uh, Antonia Prelick would have been involved in, but I think she obviously saw that electronic uh, collections were coming. Uh, we moved in that direction. And uh, while uh, who doesn't love to hold a real book with all kinds of beautiful illustrations in it, um, it's also important to have the other side of that. So it's been a real pleasure to talk to you today, not this morning, about um, preserving and making this treasure really perpetually available to share. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that our new director wants your thoughts, and I'm happy to answer any questions. 